This is Tech and Politics, and my name is Andreas Jungherr. Welcome back to the podcast accompanying the lecture series Digital Media and Politics and Society at the University of Bamberg. Today, we look at three studies illustrating how to approach different aspects of the contemporary public arena empirically. As we have seen, the public arena is a crucial element of democratic societies, linking communication to political competition and democratic representation. It comes as no surprise then to see it a concept that has inspired massive research activity. The digital transformation of the public arena has featured very prominently in recent research. Interests, approaches and methods and studies on the contemporary digitally extended public arena mirror the richness of the concept and its related areas. Possible topics include the detailed examination of structures hosting the public arena, their constitution, contextual embeddedness and shaping power for discourse and political competition. Shifting and competition norms and practices among actors within the public arena. Changing patterns of political competition within the digitally extended public arena and the emergence of challenges to the status quo. Patterns of exchange and interaction within the digitally extended public arena. This short list is not complete by far, but it sketches some of the rich research opportunities within the public arena. To get a better sense of it, we now turn to three studies that address related questions empirically. The big challenge in the contemporary digitally extended public arena is the question of attention. By now, we have repeatedly discussed that the contemporary public arena is no longer limited by access or the volume of information. Instead, its limits are set by the limits of individual and collective attention. Winning in the intense competition for attention is of crucial importance for actors within the public arena. While academics need to understand the underlying dynamics and associated limits. A recent study by Adrian Rauchfleisch and colleagues illustrates how one can do so. In the article How COVID-19 Displays Climate Change, Adrian Rauchfleisch, Dario Siegen and Daniel Vogler examine whether attention to one issue of grave societal importance, climate change, was replaced by attention to another issue of great urgency, COVID-19, or whether attention to both issues and the associated challenges persist. They examine this by analyzing the presence of both topics in media coverage and on Twitter in Switzerland between April 2019 and October 2020. The authors collected news coverage on news websites, newspapers and transcripts from TV and radio newscasts, which left them with 1,060,820 articles during the relevant time frame. Of those, 56,128 stories referred to climate change and 174,407 to COVID-19. 6,431 stories referenced both debates. For the analysis of Twitter, they relied on a tracker covering the whole Swiss Twitter sphere during the time frame. This includes 296, 553 users, 9.7 million tweets. Through a set of topical keywords, the authors identified tweets referring to either topic, leaving them with 407,626 tweets referring to climate change and 3,214,483 mentioning COVID-19. The authors built two time series of news and Twitter attention to both topics. To identify the causal impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the attention on climate change in the public arena, they used the data from April 2019 to January 2020 and predict, based on the underlying trends, how attention to climate change would have developed from February 2020 to October 2020 if COVID-19 had not happened and the underlying dynamics of the previous year would have continued. By identifying the difference between both their prediction and the actual coverage dynamics, they can identify the impact COVID-19 had on attention toward climate change in the news and on Twitter. As expected, the authors found that after February 2020, attention in both news and on Twitter toward COVID-19 increased, while attention toward climate change clearly decreased. 
Still, some events related to climate change created attention peaks in both the media and Twitter. And overall, Twitter attention toward climate change was strongly correlated with news attention. These findings echo earlier research, indicating a strong and persistent link between news coverage and Twitter attention to current events or politics. Comparing actual attention toward climate change with predicted attention, the authors show that attention toward COVID-19 clearly had negative effects for attention toward climate change. For both news coverage and Twitter reactions, the authors find substantial negative effects, lowering news attention to climate change by 46% and attention on Twitter by 55%. This is clear evidence for the limits of attention in the public arena overall, where the prominence of a new topic, COVID-19, comes at losses for another, climate change, irrespective of its continued relevance in society. This is clearly troubling news from the perspective of climate activists or politicians intent on keeping continuous attention on the topic in order for society to keep focus and maintain efforts in fighting climate change. In further analytical step, the authors show, through the analysis of co-occurring hashtags, that climate change activists reacted to the decrease in collective attention by trying to link the issue of climate change with the issue of COVID-19. Here they find that only 0.5% of tweets contributing to the COVID-19 debate reference climate change, while 11% of tweets within the climate debate refer to COVID-19. This And by looking closely at the connecting hashtags, leads the authors to conclude that climate change activists try to tactically adjust to the new circumstances and to connect their issue of relevance, climate change, with the issue of the day, COVID-19. In its use of both time series analysis and the analysis of hashtag co-occurrences, the study by Rauchfleisch and colleague provides a helpful template for further research. Their study shows how one can approach issue attention and attention drifts in empirical research, as well as examine tactics by actors within the public arena to mitigate or profit from shifts in collective attention. Another strand of research looks at the behavior of people contributing to online discussions about politics and current events. Often, these studies focus on the hostility of contributions in online environments and explicitly or implicitly connected with specific conditions of online discourse. For example, digital environments would allow people anonymity, low accountability for their actions, and physical distance to others. In combination, these factors would activate people's negative impulses and turn them into trolls, ready to engage others in a hostile fashion or even to arrest them. In short, the internet might turn people into trolls. This set of expectations has been called the mismatch hypothesis. If true, this of course would provide bad conditions for the digitally expanded public arena. Luckily for us, Bo and colleagues put this thesis to the test. In the article, The Psychology of Online Political Hostility, Alexander Bohr and Michael Bank peterson present a series of comparative studies in which they test the effects on people's behavior and discourse of conditions found in digital communication environments. To do so, they ran a series of surveys with respondents from the US and Denmark to test whether expectations from the mismatch hypothesis would correctly predict correlations in their surveys. In the words of the authors, the mismatch thesis states that, and I quote, This class of effects imply that the perfect storm of novel online features, e.g. anonymity and rapid text-based communication, induces fleeting psychological changes that increase the likelihood of certain psychological states that undermine civil discussions. Simply put, when people log online, their level of empathy is reduced or they become more aggressive than usual. End quote. The authors contrast this hypothesis with expectations from the connection hypothesis. And I quote, Online environments are unique in creating large public forums where hostile messages may reach thousands, including many strangers, could stay accessible perennially and may be promoted by algorithms tuned to generate interactions. From this perspective, online environments do not shape how people are motivated, but shape what they can accomplish given a specific set of motivations. The hostility gap may thus emerge as a direct consequence of the larger reach of those already motivated to be hostile. End quote. 
This is an important distinction. While people might experience discussions in online environments as more hostile than offline, this might not be due to people turning into ogres online, but simply that those behaving badly are more visible. The underlying problem would then be primarily psychological and motivational, not technological. So, how do they test this? In a first set of three studies, the authors surveyed respondents from the US and Denmark to find first evidence. They find that respondents in both countries perceived online discussions to be more hostile than those offline. Respondents themselves did not express differences in their own behavior one could consider hostile between online and offline discussions. And they find that the personality trait status-driven risk-seeking is no stronger correlated between self-reported hostile behavior on or offline. They build on these findings in a fourth study by using a more comprehensive scale to measure self-reported hostile behavior. They ran the study with respondents from the US. Again, they find no difference between self-reported hostile behavior on or offline. In combination, these studies do not support the mismatch hypothesis. The authors continue to refine their findings and test different aspects of the mismatch thesis in three subsequent experiments. We skip these studies to focus on the test of the connectivity thesis. Let it suffice then that the experiments also do not provide evidence for the mismatch hypothesis. In a final study, the authors test the connectivity hypothesis. For this, they survey people from the US and Denmark on whether they had witnessed attacks against self, friends and strangers in on- or offline environments. Here, the respondents clearly report to have witnessed attacks most often within online instead of offline environments, with the strongest difference being reported for attacks on strangers. In combination, the authors see their findings as rejecting the mismatch hypothesis. And I quote, Our research suggests that people do not engage in online political hostility by accident. Online political hostility reflects status-driven individuals' deliberate intentions to participate in political discussions and offend others in both online and offline contexts. In large online discussion networks, the actions of these individuals are highly visible, especially compared with more private online settings. End quote. The article offers an instructive example for the challenge of identifying the drivers between perceived hostility and deviance in digital communication environments. While it is tempting to attribute digital technology causal effects on people's behavior, it might simply be that they make more of the behavior visible. That alone does not solve the problem of hostility in the digitally extended public arena, but it helps us identify its drivers and design interventions. Beyond the substantive interest, the study also offers an interesting template for careful empirical work presenting a set of carefully designed studies, first translating broad expectations into testable hypotheses, allowing for the identification of different mechanisms leading to similar outcomes. The public arena consists of spaces that host discourses in which societal actors compete for attention and dominance. The digital manifestations of this competition offer us a detailed view of the content, patterns and tactics of this competition. Especially the microblogging service Twitter has proved to be a promising research environment to better understand the competition between actors for attention in the public arena. But other environments such as Instagram or Reddit also start to feature more strongly in research. One example for such an analysis is a paper by Kurt Knüpfer and colleagues. In their paper, Hijacking Me Too, Transnational Dynamics and Networked Frame Contestation on the Far Right in the Case of the 120 Decibels Campaign, Kurt Knüpfer, Matthias Hoffmann and Vadim Voskresensky analyze the hashtag 120DB campaign on Twitter. In late January 2018, members of the Austrian and German Far Right Identitarian Movement launched a social media campaign. The goal of the campaign was, and here I quote a translation by the authors, and I quote, According to the German website, the core goal is the conversation of an ethnocultural identity in what is referred to as the age of mass migration, globalization and one world propaganda. End quote. In this, the activists encourage women to, and I quote, 
use social media posts to talk about your experiences as a female with foreign infiltration, harassment and violence. End quote. In the campaign, far-right actors latched onto the momentum and frames established by the feminist hashtag MeToo campaign. But this association is merely rhetorical and stylistic, for example through videos imitating the style of grassroots testimonial videos. This is a shift from tactics of the past, where far-right activists might have actively and openly challenged successful frames presented by left or feminist activists. Here instead of openly challenging or contesting the frame, they try to co-opt it and refocus attention away from the original goal, sexist behavior and practices condoned by a patriarchal social system, to their own political goals, painting migrants as a broad societal threat. And I quote, The campaign did so by drawing explicit attention to acts of violence against women perpetrated by foreign men or recent immigrants. This form of strategic frame contestation is not characterized by an outright dismissal of the original framing effort, but rather by a narrowing of the original problem definition and the propagation of a different set of policy demands. End quote. This tactic is what the authors term hijacking. To analyze this tactic, they collected tweets containing the campaign hashtag, hashtag 120db, through the Twitter streaming API between January 30 and May 31, 2018, the run of the campaign. During that time, they collected 172,972 tweets from 44,834 unique user profiles. Of the tweets mentioning hashtag 120db, roughly 10% were also mentioning hashtag MeToo. The authors see this, and specific temporal and language patterns, as evidence that the originators of the campaign very actively tried to use the attention on hashtag MeToo to launch their own campaign and inject their contesting frame within the larger hashtag MeToo debate. Not the least, by injecting their specific regional claims within a larger international debate. The authors continue their analysis through a qualitative look at the content of messages using both hashtags. Here, they look for the occurrence of three tactics, and I quote, First, agenda surfing is characterized by encouraging and progressive feminist messages, usually referencing hashtag MeToo without evaluation. Second, reframing undermining features a critical evaluation of hashtag MeToo, accentuating the seemingly more accurate problem definition of hashtag 120db. Third, critical anti-120db tweets included negative evaluation of hashtag 120db and sometimes also of hashtag MeToo. End quote. The authors hand-coded 123 tweets containing both hashtags that were posted during the first 48 hours of the campaign regarding their correspondence with these tactics. Here, the authors found that tweets with co-occurring hashtags were dominated by critical stance toward the hashtag 120db campaign, as well as those trying to actively reframe hashtag MeToo following the far-right agenda. Mere agenda surfing tweets were in the minority. This shows that activists from the far right, as well as from the original hashtag MeToo movement, actively engaged in frame contestation around the concerned hashtags, with far right activists pushing into the campaign and attention space generated by hashtag MeToo, and activists in that space pushing actively back and defending the movement from this attempt at hijacking attention and momentum. Of course, the study by Knüpfer and colleagues addresses other questions as well. But for our purposes, let this be enough. The study is an interesting close look at the tactics used by activists within the public arena in their competition for attention. It is also interesting as it presents a case for Twitter-based and discursive activism from the far right. Often these tactics are discussed with a focus on left-leaning groups. But, as Knüpfer and colleagues show, these tactics can be successfully employed from the political right as well, weakening the argument that campaign tools or styles can be owned or associated with specific factions of the political spectrum. Associated imbalances in the literature are more likely due to skewed attention by researchers. The contemporary constellation of the public arena looks different from the past. Digital technology has weakened traditional structures, introduced new ones, and contributed to much soul-searching and norm-shifting for actors providing structures of the public arena and those competing within it. 
these shifts mean that both public and society need to adjust the expectations of and practices within the public arena. But also academia needs to adjust to these new constellations. While these shifts are associated with great fears for our democracy or the quality of discourse, they also bring tremendous research opportunities. Empirical research is challenged to examine the nature, functions and power relationships within structures of the public arena, old and new. How do news media differ from new digital platforms, or how do they resemble each other? What can we learn from the study of one type of structure about another? Also, empirical research needs to find ways to examine patterns of information flow, discourse dynamics, and interaction behavior within the contemporary public arena. How does information flow between structures old and new? Do new features of structures influence the way discursive competition happens between actors in the public arena, or can we observe shifts in power? Or how do people behave when engaging in political exchanges in structures old and new? Finally, empirical research also needs to focus on outcomes. What are the effects of the new constellation of structures within the public arena? Do digital media contribute to polarization within society? What does algorithmic shaping do for information exposure and attitude formation? And is there evidence for more or different paths to radicalization in the new public arena? But, of course, we do not only need empirical research. Maybe the primary task right now lies with the development of theoretical or normative concepts of what to expect from the contemporary public arena. What are the functions and normative goals we demand from news media or digital platforms hosting the contemporary public arena? What do we expect from political elites competing under the changed conditions of the contemporary public arena? And what do we expect from the public? The contemporary public arena brings many opportunities for people, elites and society. But to capitalize on them, we need to have a better understanding of its shape, dynamics and effects. Here, there is clear need for creative, but empirically grounded, conceptual, theoretical and normative work. Importantly, this goes beyond easy critiques in the mode of supposed deterministic societal decline, as, for example, in the mode of surveillance capitalism. Too often work like this is empirically ill-founded and too strongly in the tradition of a critical stance that sees capitalism or for-profit companies as the source of all evil. These works tell us little about actual changes within the public arena, its effects on individuals and society, and ultimately do not offer much of a way forward. Besides, of course, abolishing capitalism. Instead, we need to become better at understanding what is actually happening. In other words, establishing meaningful transparency for structures of the public arena old and new, and surfacing and negotiating tensions that exist within and between structures of the public arena, old and new, and actors competing within it. The new structures of the public arena are here to stay. As we have seen, they mitigate some of the ills of previous constellations within the public arena, but introduce some new ills and inspire new worries. It is up to society to figure out the norms and practices allowing us to pursue the public good under these new conditions. Turning back the clock is not an option. Neither should it be, given the well-understood but currently often ignored ills of a public arena dominated by a few powerful structures heavily aligned with the powers that be in economy, politics and society. The current structural transformations of the public arena are noisy, contested and surface very real political and societal tensions and fractions. But engaged constructively and creatively, these transformations can be used to strengthen societies by engaging these tensions and structures instead of weakening it by trying to ignore and hide them. This is it, both for today and for this season. This podcast will take a break. But not to worry, the podcast will be back next semester in some way, shape or form. As always, the script to this episode can be found online on the course website, digitalmedia.andreasjunger.de. There, you will find detailed sources, references to further reading, links and preparatory questions for the exam. This was Tech and Politics, the podcast of the Chair for the Governance of Complex and Innovative Technological Systems at the University of Bamberg. I'm Andreas Jungherr. Have fun reading. And see you soon.